that earlier in, in our program. Um, and I wanted to tell you about you know, the students that you'll be speaking to. I, I think I mentioned it. Paso San Futuro is a, a journalism program for high school kids. Um, students, sorry. Some of them want to be journalists. Uh, many don't or don't know yet, but they get to try it on for a week or so. And, and yesterday they were reporting everywhere. They can talk to you about that. And basically, we just want to hear from your experience and have an opportunity to, I don't know, hear from that. Um, I'm honored. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming. So I'll just sit in the back and listen. All right, I'm just going to, just to give you a sense of some of the stuff I write, you can just look at it, pass it along. Articles of mine from Latino Rebels, Rosanos, and Red Eye. Um, so I guess I was invited here to talk because at, at the other... Latino Vote. Yeah, the Latino Vote uh, Symposium, I talked about um, kind of what made me become a writer. And um, especially, I mean, especially for, I think, Latinos, if you tell people you want to be a writer, they get a weird stare. Like, what's that? What's journalism? Like, what is that? Um, I mean, for me, I mean, I grew up in the city. I had, I had a Honduran immigrant mom, and my dad was... You're in Yeah. <laughs> I just came from Honduras, like, a week ago. Where are you from? De Lucía Alpa. De Lucía Alpa. I'm from Santa Lucía. Um, but uh, yeah, my mom's from Honduras, and uh, my dad's Puerto Rican. He was well. That, that, that's where the story starts. I mean, he was a he was a Chicago police officer, and he was like a drug addict too. So my mom had to, we had to dip, and we had to go to the suburbs. And um, you know, I just kind of questioned, like, you know, in my I grew up in a suburb where like there was a lot of Latinos, but. And there was a lot of immigrants, but all the Latinos, all the black people, all the immigrants, because we had a lot of immigrants, like Polish and Russian, we all lived like on the poor side of town, and all like there's a lot of like rich people on the other side of town. And so that kind of stuff, those were just like the facts of my life. And I kind of started question, you know, maybe like in high school, I started questioning like why is why is my town organized like that? Like, why is it designed like that? Why are why are all of us over here in these like ghetto ass apartments while the other side of town is like pretty affluent. And when I I actually came to Nepal my freshman year, I wanted to well I, I didn't want to be an accountant, but I was the first I was the oldest grandkid and so everybody was like pressuring me to be an accountant or a lawyer or a doctor. Those are the only options. Or a businessman. And so I said accounting, whatever, I came to Nepal. This is actually my I still have my folder from freshman year. <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, thought it was appropriate to bring that. Um, and I came to do accounting, but I think maybe the second, we have trimester here. So my third trimester, I started blogging on the side. You know, I'm taking accounting classes. I was in the honors accounting program, struggle program. And then I started blogging. My first blog was about just random stuff. Like, it was pretty embarrassing. Like I was talking about like stuff in my town, stuff like with my friends and my family, and lot, like a lot of people back from my hometown would actually read it. And you know, I got a lot of readership that way. And but that was just like an outlet. Like I had something in me that wanted that I I needed to write. Like I needed to, you know, I just, just blogging it kind of just came out. This is back in like two thousand three, two thousand four. So. Um, I started blogging that way, and then um, I was like working for Dell, and I just didn't want. I, there was this place, this room called the Beehive, and the Beehive is this big open space where there's all these cubicles, and I was like, mm, I like, I was making like more money than I thought I would be making at that age, and I was just like, no, I can't do this. And then I met somebody, an older person, like he was like fifty something. And he said that he was an accountant, and he quit his job, and he went to do history. Now, when I was taking my my uh, accounting classes, I was always all my electives would be history or social, like anything social science. And so I had kind of like a mid college crisis. Some of you will have that, unfortunately. And uh, I thought, like, what do I want to do? What do I like to do? And it was history, and so I that's what I majored in. Um, and uh, I started, I mean, when you when you go to college, the student newspaper, I mean, you guys, a lot of you guys went to Nepotis. Nepotis is a pretty progressive school. But 
Uh, or when after the school I came from, you couldn't talk Spanish in, in, the, in the hallways. You'd get detention because um, they thought you were you were talking bad about those other students. So uh, Spanish is my first language, and I lost it, and I had to relearn it. Um, but so when I came to college, there was a student newspaper, and I kind of wanted to write for it, but I thought I thought that was a white thing. Like it wasn't something that I you know I had all these machista ideas in my head, like you know guys don't write and all this stuff, like just stuff that comes from the culture, right? And um, I, I ended up writing for the student paper, and then I ended up editing it. And then, uh, but at the time, I still wasn't writing about Latino issues, because I didn't know what Latino issues were. I, was, I started taking classes, um, definitely take classes, because you know, the good thing about college is college, they won't teach you what to think, but they'll teach you how to think, or how to like get information for yourself, which is really the most important thing college can teach you. Um, but, so yeah, I mean, my, when I graduated from school, my, I, my last teacher, she told me about those songs. And she said they were a Latino website. I hadn't, I hadn't heard of them either. And that's kind of, that started the whole thing. I wrote for Los Amos. My first article was on Machismo. And I've been writing for them for five years now. And I was a managing, I became managing editor of Los Amos. And now I'm an editor. I'm also, I became managing editor of Latino Rebels. You'll find in journalism, it kind of goes like that. You have to, um, especially with Latino journalism, you have to, Show that you can do it, because nobody's going to give you that open door right off the bat. If you're lucky, awesome. If, you're, if you get that open door right off the bat, awesome. But nobody's going to give you that open, that open door. You kind of have to keep pounding, kind of have to keep proving that you can write, that you can do good journalism. And I guess, I mean, the other thing I want to talk about is what, what good journalism is. Um, good journalism for, I mean, for... Latinos means telling our stories, right? Telling the truth as as we see it, like bearing it's called bearing witness. You know what what is happening in our communities? Because there's a lot of great sites that show, like DNA Info is a great site that you can learn information about in different neighborhoods, but they have sort of an outsider's perspective, right? And there's nothing really wrong with that. You get like pretty good objective information, but you find out, like, say, if there's a story on DNA Info on this. Um, there was a coffee house in Pilsen, the Boat Trust uh, coffee house that opened up. They had a different spin on that, on what the sign, there were signs on the Boat Trust saying white people get out of Pilsen, all this stuff. And they kind of spin it in a certain way. And so for, and you'll see in one of the articles I passed out, I wrote an article for, for the Red Eye on that. And I was just, the Red Eye is a Tribune company, and the Tribune company is very conservative. So I was always arguing with my editor, or always pitching ideas to my editor about gentrification, about racism in Chicago, about um, people running for office in Chicago that I wanted to talk about. And those pitches would always get um, shot down. And um, I would always tell, like, I would always, if I, whenever I told people in the city, like I wrote for Red Eye, they would say, um, if they were white, they'd be like, oh, cool, I read that. And if I, they were Latino, they were saying, and I'm actually pretty proud of the stuff I wrote for Red Eye because I was trying to tell our, my story, you know, the stuff that was going on in Humboldt Park, stuff that was, uh, the sound was just based in Pilsen, so a lot of stuff that's going on in Pilsen, a lot of stuff that's going on in La Villita, a lot of stuff that's going on in Women's Square. And so good journalism, I just met a, a really good journalist from, uh, from El Salvador. He, wrote a, he just wrote a book. I would recommend everybody, if you're thinking about journalism, read it. He just came out with it this, this spring. I wrote a review on it for Los Amos. It's called the history, a history of Violence. He is a journalist in El Salvador. He writes for El Faro. He writes for like I don't know if you guys seen the movie Spotlight, but he has an there's an investigative team mm -hmm. in uh, El Faro called uh, Sala Negra, and they do hardcore. They go after the government. Like last year, he wrote a story about how the police in El Salvador killed a bunch. Like they arrested people, handcuffed them, and then shot them. Up. And he found that out. And when he when he published it in July, he had to leave the country. And uh, when they asked him what he thought about that, like having to leave the country, having to hide out, having to hide your family, he said, I love this quote, he said, um, journalism that doesn't like offend anybody or piss anybody off is probably shitty journalism. And that's so true, you know. Um, there's, you're gonna work for people who, 
they want you, you know, they want you to not be offensive or not offend, offensive in even in the sense of like challenging their preconceived notions of how things are. Um, I got that a lot of red eye, um, but the 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 fun. I'm really jealous of you guys because Latino media is kind of really still coming into its own, um, even in the what six years I've been in Latino media. Um, it's really, really expanded. Um, Latino Rebels, we have Remescla, we have There's Fusion. Um, a lot of, what what you're going to see is a lot more of what Los Samos does, which is like each town, each community has like their own local thing. Because I don't, um, in, in, in Latino journalism, there's, well, even in Latino culture, there's the whole sense of um, de aquí y de allá, right? It's like you're half here, you're half there. So there's this, there's this um, really close knit community type of journalism, but also like speaks to what's going on in Latin America. But um, uh, I just wanted to kind of, I'm really surprised that a lot of you are here. I thought, you know, Latino students, high schoolers interested in writing and journalism, like I didn't know this many of Latinos. And when I was a senior in high school, who wanted to write. So, I mean, that's really um, encouraging. And um, I really wanted to just hear what you guys had to say or any questions that I could answer. I could, I'm all yours, I guess. I, I did want to ask you, Edgar, you started by saying that you didn't know what Latino issues were. Um, so could you speak a little bit about how you kind of educated yourself on the Latino community? I'm still educating myself. Uh, educating yourself is a lifelong project. Um, I, when I when I first started writing, I used to write about the Middle East because that's what everybody's writing about. Mm. And I learned a lot about the Middle East. And you know, I don't kind of I had this you know my brain had a thirst for knowledge. I wanted to make sense of the world. Like my my personal life, my town was so messed up. Like with my family and being poor, being working class, single parent home. Use of dad, all that, all that stuff. Every you know, you guys are Latinos. I'm sure you guys know you personally or your friends or family. But um, since that was so, um, the facts of that was so confusing. I didn't understand like why this was happening. I tried to make sense of the outside world. I became like a big nature nerd. Still am. Like I, would, I could name every bird, name every tree, just by the sound of the bird. I can name it. But um, when I the shift came when I wanted to start writing for Latino media because I felt I felt like a an obligation. Like if you and some of you probably feel this, like you feel different. You feel like maybe you like couldn't understand things better, or you're or you're better at studying, or you're really more curious. Um, you have a, a, an ability to gain knowledge. I mean, it's your obligation. Especially I feel especially as Latinos and Latinas to share that knowledge. And the way I went about it is um, just from the very bottom. Um, I took classes in like, you know, intro to Latin, his, Latin American history, you know? And uh, you just bump into professors, especially, who um, I had this one professor, he taught Puerto Rican history. He, he's a uh, professor Jose Lopez. He's, his, his brother is Oscar Lopez, who's in prison. Who's in the longest serving political prisoner in, in history. Um, and he just, you know, professors like that, you know, it's not so much what I learned in his class, it's that, you know, you have an obligation to, we have an obligation to know our history, to know ourselves, you know, to know what what the facts of our, our surroundings are and why they exist that way. And um, there's, the internet's kind of like the wild, wild west. There's a lot of lies, there's a lot of things being told, a lot of noise, and you have to learn how to think critically, how to process the information that's on the internet, like, like where did this person get this information, like, how can I trust that they did that, um, what are their motives behind saying this, I mean, it's really, um, a lot of people have this bro knowledge, you know, where they get all this stuff on Wikipedia or something, and they think that they know stuff. But you really have to kind of 
I mean, you, you, you go to the library, you go, to, you, you, you find what you want to learn about, and you, like, right now I'm learning more about Honduran history, and so I look up books that are canonical, you have to sometimes avoid those too, <laughs> but it's good to know what's in them, um, and uh, you just go methodically, That's a, that I learned that in, in college, I learned how to do that, you know, writing my, my senior thesis for history, you learn how to like this is what I want to know. Where do I go to get that information? And and college and, and professors and ways of thinking uh, are really critical. Developing those tools are really critical. I was just talking to my wife in the car now. Like you know, critical thinking. If you know how to think critically, it changes your whole life. It changes how you get information. It, it, it changes how you think about what you already think you know. Um, and it affects your relationships. It affects the way you, how you deal with people, how you deal with the world, how you how you examine yourself, your your your, your own strengths and your own weaknesses. So um, you guys are entering a good phase for that. So really pay attention and take advantage of that. Anything else? Any question? I mean, do you guys want to? I mean, do you guys want to know what my life is like as a writer? Please. Yeah. Sure. Kind of depressing. Um, <laughs> no, I mean it's it's a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. It really is. It's a lot of reading. It's a, like back reading, and and it's a lot of going out and talking to people and seeing things and witnessing things. And you know, I when you want to be a writer, when when I was in high school, I, I just thought that I would you know maybe write for like two hours a day and. Maybe read a book here and there, and you know, I'd be famous. You're not going to be fit, rich and famous, especially Latino journalists, because you know, I mean, there's, a, there's a big problem. I don't know if you guys read The Guardian, but there was an article just last month. It was called the what was it? The the enduring whiteness of of American media, and it talked about how. I mean, we all know this. There's there's not that many Latino journalists. There's not that many Latino. Not only Latino journalists, but Latinos in editing on editorial boards, which is very important. That an editorial board uh, kind of dic dictates what what the news will be. Literally, what the news will be. You know, obviously there's a bunch of news going on in, in, in Chile and, and in Oaxaca and in Puerto Rico and Honduras. But if you, if the editorial board thinks that that's not worthy of space in the newspaper or worthy of time of editing or putting on the website, then that just doesn't get told. And then people in your high school think that nothing's going on in Oaxaca, nothing's going on in Puerto Rico, or nothing's going on in Honduras. And so you kind of, being a Latino journalist is, is a lot of really being annoying as editors and kind of, you're towing that line because you don't want to be fired, but you also don't want to be a sellout. You also have to feel an obligation to, um, like I said, bear witness, tell tell the truth the way in your truth. And um, on, a, on a given day, I, I edit um, in the mornings, then I write, then I read all afternoon, and then I either do more reading after dinner or I do more editing after dinner. And that's pretty much every day. And the days that I take off are there. There are no days off. Like. You take off a day, but you're you're you are you're basically like ditching work because there's always work. Like my my wife would always say to me, like, "Do you have work tonight?" She you know, she comes home. Do you have work tonight? Do you have work tonight? I'm, I'm at my desk, and I'm like, I always have work. There's always work. There's always books to read. There's always there's always news. You know, you, you can't take. I went to Honduras and I didn't do any I didn't do any work, and I had fun. But I'm also, I was a nervous wreck, you know, because you're, you're worried, you know that news is happening. News is always happening. And you know that one, lies are going to be told about the news. And uh, I, I just saw a uh, drama, which is a website, they just put out a video with this girl who's, she's Venezuelan, and she explains what's wrong with Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And it's very one-sided. And it went viral. The video went viral, and everybody's like, wow, look at your blah, blah, blah. And a bunch of people said, hey, Hector, have you seen this girl talking about what's going on in Venezuela? Everybody's sharing it, and everybody thinks it's, you know, 
dead on. And I was in Honduras at the time, and I was like, oh, like, you know, I, I want to be, I'm, you know, at the same time I'm, at, I'm on a beach or I'm in Santa Lucia, you know, and exploring my roots, but you always, um, there's a leash between you and your, and your computer, a leash between you and your desk, and that leash keeps tugging all day, all day. Like, I need to get back to my desk, I need to keep writing, I need to keep blah, 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 I keep editing. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of, lot of work, like, um, literally backbreaking, like, you, you have to find a really good desk chair. I mean, I know that sounds funny, that sounds funny, but you are going to be living in your chair, or at your desk, and, um, I used to write in the weirdest places, and that's on my back, and stuff, but, um, so that's, I mean, that's pretty much my day, my day, will, my day will, is work. It's either reading, which I consider work, because good journalism is also knowing like what you're talking about. You're not just right. There's a philosophy that, and maybe you'll disagree with me, but there's a philosophy that a journalist has to be objective, right? But there's also another philosophy that it's impossible to be objective. I mean, we come, we come to everything with our experiences, with our preconceived notions, our beliefs, our politics, our philosophies, and so to, and just by the very nature of what you report, I'm going to report on immigration, I'm going to report on Puerto Rico, I'm going to report on Rio, that um, reveals a bias in what you're interested in, what you want to tell. So. I, I'm kind of weary, I'm, I'm usually weary of people, of journalists especially, who claim to be completely objective. Because um, I think it's, it's, I think it's just impossible. I think only a machine is objective. But um, that's pretty much my day, uh, except today, talking to you guys. But uh, even today, I mean, I was up at 5.30 and I was at my desk. I was just started reading your dissertation. Yeah, I re re really read it. No, I really liked it because I don't know if you know this. <laughs> you and my mother have read my dissertation. Really? <laughs> you know, I, I, was interested in it because, I don't know if you know this, but I, I, I was also the uh, inaugural staff member of La Respuesta, which is a um, Puerto Rican diasporic um, website. Yeah. And so I was really interested in how you're talking about how. Um, the, the public relations messaging has to be geared towards the, communi the community's ends and not the organization's ends, right. which is really important. I think, and I, I think we were naturally doing that without even knowing that we were doing it. Yeah. I hope we were doing it. I'm going to tell all my academic friends that I have one person who read my dissertation. Really? They'll be impressed. Right. Uh, <laughs> but actually, I was going to mention something because, so I, I told them all I was a journalist before I, I, I became a public relations person. Um, and I've never, I don't even like the word, ob the word objectivity. I do advocacy. Um, so I've ne even as a journalist, I never was objective. There's always an advocacy because of who you call to interview, the topic that you choose and all that. And, and then one of the, the things that I wanted to ask you about is when you write for publications like Osamos and you like write for publications like, like Latino Rebels, um, I'm a little maybe concerned that I feel like sometimes we are preaching to the choir. So we're only talking to like-minded people. Um, are there opportunities to kind of reach across to people who are not like-minded? Opportunities to maybe educate or inform those people? I mean, that's a really big problem in media in general. Because um, media be has become so personalized. Uh, if you're conservative, you have Fox News, you have Progressive, you have MSNBC. Um, and having been, I am on the editorial board at Latino Rebels and um, we have arguments all the time on what voices we should be giving platforms. Um, I'm in, I'm for the school that um, free market of ideas, you know, especially in Latino in the Latino community. Like there's there's issues going on in our community that we don't even we don't have a get a chance to think about, much less argue about, right? What is what does Latino mean? Am I Latino or Hispanic? What does Hispanic mean? Like, am I American first or Puerto Rican first? Or like all this stuff, right? Um, am I white? Am I mestizo? Am I, you know, all this stuff? 
Um, so I, re, I mean, Latino media, for me, if it does anything, it has to provide a space for um, free discussion, meaning, meaning arguments. Not meaning like, hey, oh yeah, you agree with that? Yeah, I agree with that. No, like, I, we all know what we share in common. It, it's really important to to understand our differences because we're, we're being lumped together, right? And in that lumping, you forget um, culture, you forget history, you forget traditions, and you forget the, the details of what makes you you. Even though you, like when I grew up, I didn't really know what Honduran meant, I didn't know what Puerto Rican meant. I just knew I like, I was going to live there, so I and I, you know, I said vos. That's all I mean. But I mean, just we are where we come from. Like we, you guys are all here. Like who's who's parents? Who else has parents who are immigrants? Right. So like, had your parents not left, your life would be complete. You can't even imagine it. You can't even imagine it. Like you, you, you wouldn't be. Like you, you know, nobody, nobody back home in Honduras knows what the Paul is. No, nope. they don't even have an idea of what Chicago is. They just say Michael Jordan. <laughs> you know, so like we have, but I'm no different from them. Like I'm only here out of pure chance, pure chance. And you know, I, 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 I I'm a firm believer that nobody really wants to leave their home. Like nobody, nobody really wants to leave home. You leave home because home doesn't have the things for you that. You need to be fulfilled, to be happy, and so that was another question I asked myself: Why did Why did my mom leave Honduras? Why Why aren't my Why isn't my Puerto Rican side still in Puerto Rico? You ask those questions, and they lead to answers and more questions, and then that's the life of a journalist: is is really, um, you know, there's a story about Puerto Rico. You know, there's a story about Honduras. The, the good journalism is is correcting it, you know, correcting the narrative, or at least a, a, a giving your perspective on it, giving, you know, re representing where you come from in it, not just other people talking about where you come from. You know, you have to talk, you have to talk about where you come from. And so um, that's kind of what I hope everybody here has in mind of doing that. I, I think what you guys do, because you guys are being very proactive about, you know, you got to really challenging. Okay, do I really want to do this? I mean, goes, let me go to this thing at Paul and see. You know, that's that's what good journalists do. They don't just think, oh, okay, I'll write that down. No, they say, let me find out if this is something. I'm going to go see what it's like, and then I'll make a decision. That's awesome. That's exactly how you make decisions. <laughs> That's the other thing. I mean, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of old school thinking in Latino culture um, that you know my wife makes a lot more than I do, and I have people in my family and friends who say, like you know, or that since you write, you don't work, That's not, especially in Latino. Culture. If you write, you don't work. Because working means going somewhere and sitting somewhere and doing stuff with your hands somewhere else outside. That's work. And so um, when I tell people I'm a journalist, even now, they say, oh, so you don't work. And you'll get that. And in Latino journalism, it's half the time true. But um, there, I mean, there, you have, it's a different kind of work. And balancing social life, that's probably the hardest thing in my whole life. That's the biggest thing, you know, where my wife is on the couch and she's like, let's binge watch Orange is the New Black. And I'm like, mm, after 10 o'clock, you know, I want to be there, you know, I want to, I want to go, I want to hang out, I want to go to family things, I want to be normal, but it's not a normal job, it just isn't. And, um, it's something that I really want to do. And the way I see it, like, 
my wife supports me. That's one thing you got to do. You got if you're gonna be with somebody in a relationship, and I know this is like personal, but it's journalism for sure. If you're gonna be with uh, in, a, in a relationship with somebody, they have to be like behind what you do. Because if you don't, you're gonna be trying to be doing something that you that's pretty impossible to be a Latino journalist. And then on top of that, you have somebody who's like pulling you away from it. It's just not gonna work. It's just not gonna work. And so you know. Most nights I'm at my desk and my wife understands. She understands and she, she knows that I'm, I'm not doing it for, I'm doing it for a, a, a dream, man. You guys have a dream, you know? Something that's bigger than yourself. It's, it kind of feels selfish, but it, it really isn't because it's, you know, it's, it's, again, it's an obligation, you know, like, I can, I can do something, so I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do it as best as I can. And um, any time that I'm, again, when I'm not at my desk, I feel really guilty, you know? I feel really guilty whenever I'm not writing, whenever I'm not reading. Because um, there, again, there's people back in Honduras where I would be at some, you know, pulperia. Everybody has a pulperia over there. And I'd be in a pulperia, and I'd be working there, and I would think nothing of it. There's, in Honduras, there's no writer. Nobody wants to be a writer in Honduras. Like, if they do, they squash it right away. Squash because it's just not. That's like saying I want to be a unicorn, you know. <laughs> so they, they don't. They don't even. They're like, oh, that'd be nice. But I didn't like my. I found out my grandma's like really into poetry. She recited this poem to me for like ten minutes, and I'm like, why didn't she do that? She's like, oh, it's just that isn't a that isn't a thing. It's not even a thing, you know. There's like a few journalists, but you don't know them, you know. And that's how it is in Latino media. It's really short. I mean, who who, who can name a Latino journalist? I mean, <laughs> they can. Uh, Jorge Ramos. Yeah. Well, yeah, he's the most famous. But, um, <laughs> but right, right? That That's really important, right? You can name white journalists. Like, if, if, if you want to be a basketball player, or you if you want to do something, you can name somebody who's Latino, or somebody who's, who came from where you came from and did what you did. And that's so important, right? Because, like, you see the path. It's not, it's not you inventing the path, it's somebody else invented the path. And you're saying, okay, I'll just do what they did. But in Latino journalism, you know, who do you, who do you aspire to? Like, you, I, take, I take things from, from white writers, from white journalists, obviously, you know, the things that I admire, but they don't do what I do. They don't do what I want to do, you know, because they, they couldn't. They didn't come from where I came from. They didn't even, it wasn't even, my problems, the things that I worry about in the world or in the city, it wasn't even on their radar, you know. So, you have to, being a Latino journalist is kind of inventing a thing that you don't even know, you don't have a model for, right? Because Jorge Ramos, he's, he's a great Latino journalist, but, or very respected, but I don't want to do what he did, he does. I don't want to be on TV, I don't want to host a show. Um, I, I, I don't want to I don't want to do that. So I, while I admire him and he's opened the door and he's made Latino journalism prominent, you have to kind of make your own path in this because there's a lot of different things. There's columnists like we were talking about earlier before. There's columnists, there's reporters, there's all kinds of journalists. There's TV journalists, there's radio. There's you know um, I was on Latino USA and Latino USA and NPR. That's another great. Um, media outlet coming up. Um, who here knows uh, Maria Inyosa? She's uh, a here. Yeah. And uh, she's she's my boss's boss. Um, and I've met her. She's nice. And she's from Pilsen. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you kind of make, you kind of go in the woods trying to find your own path and it's really important that you, you, you kind of know what, who you want to be and what kind of What do you mean when I have to be objective? Like when you, you don't like, put your feelings into writing, like how do you manage to do that? To like leave your opinion out of it? Well, why do you have to do that? Um, I mean, because I hear what you're saying, and a lot of 
journalism professors will tell you, like, you have to do that. You have to be, just state the facts. And there's value in that, right? There is value in that. But, I mean, what I, what I do, I'm, I'm more of a columnist, if you consider a columnist. I, I give, I read a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, and then I comment on the news, you know? So you have to read a lot. You can't just comment or else you're just talking crap. But, um, I mean, I don't think you have to do that. I don't think, especially as, I mean, if you're Latino and you want to be objective about immigration, how do you do that? If you want to be objective about, if I want to be objective about, you know, the coup regime in Honduras or the, the, the different crises in, in Puerto Rico, I'm Puerto Rican Honduran, how do I, how am I objective? Like, how do I even protect, like, that would be super hard. And like even I was telling somebody the other day, like a lot of times you'll get asked to. I got asked to write copy for a T-Mobile. They were coming out with this new phone, you know, and they wanted me to compare it to Marvel Comics. And um, they're like, "Oh, it's just 500 words." I'm like, "Yeah, whatever." Then they gave me whatever amount of money. I'm like, "All right, fine." And that was so hard to write. That was so. It took me forever. Like I just took myself like a sponge and just went and tried to drip everything out of it because it wasn't what was in here. It, I didn't care. I didn't care at all about his phone, about T-Mobile, about any any of it, about Marvel, nothing. And so that kind of writing, I mean, a lot of people do it. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they're objective. I don't know how they write about, report about stuff that they don't care about. Um, you know, I, I want I want to see a journalist who gives me the facts and isn't isn't lying to me about where he or she feels about it. You know, you know, I, and, and we should get opinions from journalists. I mean, they're supposedly the people going out and investigating, getting the facts about stuff, and then yet we don't want to hear their opinion about it, which is kind of weird. But um, I don't. Yeah, to go back to your question, I don't. I don't. I try to avoid situations where I have to be objective. I really do. I mean, I will, I read things, I'm critical, um, but what is what is stating the facts objectively mean? You know, you're going to leave some facts out. You're not going to tell. You can't. You're not going to tell all the facts about something. And just by the fact of what you choose to leave out, that's you, you're being subjective. You're putting your view on it. You're telling your version of the story. You know, to follow up with that, because honestly, like I said, that's a conversation we have in journalism school all the time. Yeah. And one of the things that we're thinking about, one of the things that we talk our, to our students about now is fairness. So instead of being objective, because some of us acknowledge that that's impossible, then how are we fair in our reporting or even in our commentary? Um, is that something that you kind of look at when you're writing? Yeah, I mean, I don't... Um I'm not objective, but I'm not going to present my view as if it's whoever disagrees with it is evil. Or, you know, I you, you read my view and you know it's my view. And you know that I know I'm admitting to other points of view, and I will say what other people have said. But, I mean, fairness, right. I mean, it's everybody has their take on, on, on the truth. And... As, as Latino journalists, we are telling our side of the story. The mainstream media is going to tell its, its side of what's going on in Puerto Rico, or what's going on in Honduras or Mexico. And as Latino journalists, we have to, we should, tell our story. And we don't have to, we don't have to be ashamed that we're biased. You know? We don't have to be ashamed that we're biased. Just be fair. And like, I'm never, I'm never mean for no reason. There's some people who like, because being mean sucks, right? Having some kind of headline that says, like, Hillary Clinton is this, or that, yeah, you know what I mean? And I'm really critical on Hillary Clinton. But, um, I mean, Hillary Clinton's a, just a person, you know? I just strongly disagree with most of what she's done. But uh, I'm still fair, you know? I, I still understand that people are, you know, Bernie wasn't perfect, and nobody's perfect, and facts are, the facts are the facts that I have. And I'm young, I'm still a student, I consider myself a student, I never call myself an expert, because an expert to me is somebody who, who claims to know everything about a subject, 
and so they stop learning. You know, because if you're if I'm an expert on journalism, then I don't have to, I have nothing else to know about journalism because I'm already an expert, and that's not true. You're always going to you're always going to there's always something you have to know. There's what you know is way what you don't know is way bigger than what you know, and as long as you you approach like journalism like that, I mean you're I think you you will be fair just by by virtue. Um, you say you don't agree with what Hillary has done. Do you think Donald Trump is any better? Am I asking? Can I ask you this question now? Yeah. <laughs> well, my view is all over the internet if you want to know my view on it. But um, I, I think that um, I think there's really no difference between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. I think everything that Donald Trump says he wants to do is the stuff Hillary has done. Um, I'm Honduran. Um, I know the history of Honduras, so I know what Hillary did in Honduras. I also know she, what she did in Colombia. I also know that she supports uh, NAFTA, which destroyed the economy in Mexico and destroyed the economy here, too. Um, I know what she did, that she supported DOMA. I know that she supported uh, uh, criminal justice reform that imprisoned a bunch of black and Latino people and she made drug, doing drugs worse than, you know, destroying the economy. I just know a lot about her, and I know who's funding her campaign, which is also important. That's also, you know, that's that's critical thinking, right? What is what is Hillary gonna do in, in office? Okay, let me see. Let me just go see who's donating to her campaign. It's all Goldman Sachs, it's all Wall Street. And, and so, if they are putting so much money into her, they think, that must mean that they think she's Going to take care of them, and I mean, who here was who here was critical of Obama's presidency, or has been critical? Some people I see were so have I. And I mean, Hillary when Hillary Clinton was running against Obama in two thousand eight, she was to the right of Obama then. So, if we're critical of Obama's presidency now, why would we vote for Hillary Clinton to just to avoid Trump? Like it's 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 a it's a trick. <coughs> it's a trick, you know. It's 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 you know. You vote for the lesser of two evils, but you still get an evil. Like it's not. That's not how you. That's not how things change, you know. She said, you know. I'm, again, I'm Honduran. She said when the when the when there was sixty thousand. kids, see, this is what journalism does, right? <laughs> you get into it, you know. Sixty thousand kids were on the border. Of, men, of, of Texas, and she said, deport them all. She said, deport them all to send a message to their parents not to send them. I mean, that's something Donald Trump would say, right? It, it just is. And what's the difference between building a wall, right, and deporting every refugee that gets here? The wall is actually more humane. Because the wall, you never get in. With Hillary's plan, you get in, and then you go to a prison, for a detention center, for six months, and you're in the cold, and terrible things happen to the women there, and um, hunger strikes, and all kinds of stuff. I mean, so yeah, that's what I think about Trump and Hillary Clinton.